morning habari gani for those who speak Kiswahili bonjour à ceux qui sont euh, mes frères de, de Togo et d'autres pays et good morning to my Nigerian friends and brothers I'm going to talk about the new war in Africa I hear I wasn't there yesterday but I hear there was a session about how wars end yesterday. Apparently very interesting. I wasn't there. I missed it. You can't do everything. But I, I understood the message there was war has changed. War isn't what it used to be. Now war is definitely what it, what it didn't used to be in Africa. There's a new war. You ask the question, Dr. Shell, about the why. I'm going to try and answer that question. It's not an easy, it's, it's the most complex question, the why. And you gave me 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to try and, and, and answer that question. And forgive me if in 20 minutes, I'm not going to give you all the nuances because it's a very complex, it's a very, it's historic, it's political, it's economic, it's, it's a, there's a lot of factors there. But I'm going to give you, like the, the, we can go into it a bit deeper during our Q and A's. But let me give you some of the the outlines. But first of all, how do I change that slide? Just you give me. Ah, okay. <coughs> this is 2016. You can see that there's there's red spots. The red spots are you know where, where there's a lot of terrorism. The red spots are in Asia, they're in the Middle East, and they're somewhere across Africa. You indicated that those areas. Now, I'm going to go to 2017 here. Hop. Now, I'm going to do that again. And you see that something is happening. Something is going on. I'll do that again. Something is happening. Now, START, for some reason, doesn't give me the, the graphs for 2018. But I assure you that since 2017, the invasion into Africa has gone further. It is taking a hold on Africa. And for those who come from Europe, when it's red in these graphs, it means red. We're talking hundreds of attacks on a yearly basis. In Europe, we talk two, three, four, five, maybe ten in a year. In Nigeria, we talk hundreds of attacks on a yearly basis. The same in Mali. They don't even make it into our press. Burkina Faso. If this doesn't convince you, maybe this does. Look at 09. It was still relatively safe in Africa in 20, oh, 2010. But from 2010 onwards, the purple part is Nigeria. The gray part in the bottom is um, uh, Burkina Faso. Now today Burkina Faso is rocketing. The velocity at which Burkina Faso was invaded by terrorist organizations is amazing. It's unprecedented. Something really grave is happening in the Sahel. You ask me to focus on the Sahel I will, and there's good reasons to do that. Um, Stig, you mentioned some of the groups in, in, uh, in that part of the world uh, a couple of days ago. Um, I won't repeat them all. Um, I basically agree with most of what you said. Uh, Boko Haram, 2007, um, the, the death of um, Yusuf, Shekau, very aggressive, and it's been going very strong ever since. To Boko Haram, ISIS has come 
to partner. ISIS wanted to take over. They wanted to confiscate Boko Haram, take it, and Chekau refused. They're two separate units, they're two separate organizations. ISIS in West Africa is more into Cameroon, Chad, Boko Haram, more into Niger and um, parts of, of Nigeria. Ansaru is disappeared, it's the Al-Qaeda of, of, uh, of, um, um, of uh, Nigeria, is no longer a relevant player. Akim, um, Algeria, not a very important player today, but don't forget that Akim created um, Mujao because they felt that the Algerians could not dominate a sub-Saharan African organization, jihadi organization. So they created a sub-Saharan division of Akim called Mujao. Mujao was active in Mali. Then they decided that they should have different groups for different ethnic groups in Mali at a certain, so they split up in small different groups and then reunified again in the Nusrat al-Islam. Today, they have a unified front by the name of Nusrat al-Islam. And then they invaded into Burkina Faso after Compare left and they have the organization uh, directed by Dicko, called Ansar ul Islam in Burkina Faso. All that doesn't answer your question. Why? Before I come to that question, maybe this. The red dots are ISIS presence that invades spaces in Africa since the defeat of ISIS in the Middle East. In the border region, um, this one, Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad. This one, in the border region between Niger and Mali, I would, I would position that a bit more to the south. They're definitely in eastern Burkina Faso. They're coming south. I'll come back to that later. They're descending southwards. This one is interesting. It was mentioned this week somewhere. I think you mentioned it. The one in DRC. I'll come back to that later. It, it answered this, uh, it's part of the answer to the question of why. Um, and then I, I won't go into the, the Eastern African part. There's a new war. And I'm slowly but surely coming to the why question. Wars used to be, for a certain part of our history, from the Second World War to, to, to a couple of years ago, be regulated by the law of armed conflicts. We used to have regulatory systems to regulate our wars. It's no more the case. The law of armed conflict is no longer part of our system. It's not obeyed, it's not implemented, it's no longer what happens. It is a mixture in our wars, there's a mixture of all sorts of players. Now this is the most prominent in Burkina Faso, but it also happens in Mali and it also happens in Nigeria. Terrorist, sure, politically motivated to a certain extent. It's always difficult to define how deep that political motivation really is. Then it's mixed with bandits, criminals, ordinary people that you know make money out of illegal business. And then the security forces sort of get into the mixture. They play their role, not always I hope you don't mind, not always obeying the laws of armed conflict. And then there's the private military, the, you've heard of the, the, the Russians, the Russian private military um, outfits in, in um, Central African Republic. 
You heard of the private military outfits intervening in Mozambique. There's private military outfits all over Africa, mingling and mixing into some of these wars. And then, obviously, the communities come together and start to defend themselves because they are insecure. They're under threat. So they start to defend themselves. So you get all sorts of auto-defense mechanisms and groups that mix with security forces, private military uh, operators, bandits, and terrorists. Now, to get a grip on that mixture is a science in itself. And it's not easy. Sorry, I missed one. The most important one. This is your answer. This is the answer to your question, the why. I think we all agree, whoever you talk to in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, whoever you talk to in the Sahel, would agree that underlying all these issues is a governance issue. There is a governance problem. There's a governance vacuum, there's a governance debate, there's a governance failure, there's a governance issue somewhere underneath. Now, where does that governance issue come from? It's a state building issue. States, since the 60s, 70s, the last century, states in West Africa and in Africa in general are being built. But they're being built, they're, they're still new, they're still young, but they're built with an imported, an alien, governance, philosophy, and ideology. It is not authentic. There is something authentic in Africa. There is what we call traditional. I don't like the word, but there is such a thing as traditional systems. Now, the traditional systems, those who were in power, who had a say over resources and, and management and governance, are competing with the imported, alien, colonial governance system. So what happens, and this is the answer to your question, is a clash between modernity, the Westphalian state, and tradition, and traditional structures. Bah. Now the Westphalian state obviously feels that there is a monopoly on violence, on the side of the state. Traditional mechanisms don't recognize that. Terrorists don't recognize it. Bandits don't recognize it. Private military outfits don't necessarily respect it. So all these actors mix in a clash between a modern Westphalian state that claims um, monopoly on violence traditional and other actors that claim that they should have part of that violence, that space. And in that mixture, everybody's trying to find its place and its position. Don't forget that some of the traditional structures have aligned themselves with the modern state. Some have become corrupted and politicized by the modern state. Some are no longer working in the interest of the population, hence the auto-defense, self-defense mechanisms. And in that mixture, somehow, private military outfits try to defend their space and come in and are violent. I almost forgot to mention the religious aspect, because <laughs> as if it isn't complex enough, as if all that mixture isn't something that you can hardly govern. Now the religious dawah from the outside is mingling into that mixture and is saying, wait, we've got the answer to your problems. So religious players from external are entering into that market and are claiming part of that market. Everything, and, and, and you know that in Nigeria, um, all that becomes 
extremely relevant in the distribution of land and land ownership. Because who owns the land? Traditional leaders, private military outfits, the herders, or the state. Increasingly, civil servants from the cities have cattle. And they own cattle and claim that part of the land is theirs for their cattle, competing with traditional systems and traditional leaders and traditional governance systems. <laughs> <You're exhausted. laughs> I'm trying to give an answer to your why question in about five minutes. And it's an extremely complex issue. Um, now, there's a dynamic of, of tactics in that mixture because there's obviously answers, there's, there's responses, there's response mechanisms from states, from international actors, from international players into that mixture, trying to solve some of these issues. Um, now, what happens is that the income for these groups, the terrorist groups and the, and the bandits and, and the different players, changes from external sponsors, but because of some of the measures encountering the, the financial flows into these terrorist organizations, they no longer count on sponsorship, so they went into kidnapping, and from kidnapping, they went into extortion. Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, taxation. They start to squeeze the population. And they're now moving into pushing the population out, because the population becomes a hindrance to their illegal activities. So they went from sponsors for, uh, via extortion and they now go into legal tra trade and pushing people out because the people are a problem to their illegal activities. So their relation with the, origin, with the population changes from a source of income and recruits to a hindrance and a problem. Uh, so increasingly, you find in Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, IDPs, hundreds of thousands of IDPs, pushed out deliberately by some of the actors so that they can govern the space and have access to resources. Hence, the nexus between illegal trade, corruption, corruption, illegal trade, corruption, and terrorism. From animosity to partnerships. How am I for time? Oh. Yeah, it's okay. In West Africa, this is their space. And I need to warn you here. You, you, you're, you're quite right that it's expanding. This is the space where they operate because this is the ungoverned space and the, and the space that they are expanding to, to be able to, to, uh, to, how do you say that, operate and govern some of these spaces. And, and if you look at the, the orange dots there, they go up north into um, um, Libya and Algeria, Morocco, but they're now coming south. They're moving south. I know there's, this, there's some people here from Togo. I need to warn you, it's coming. It's coming your way. It's coming from Burkina Faso into Togo, Benin, into, uh, even into Ghana and Ivory Coast. They're moving south because they want to get access to the coast. Strategically, the coast is important. The coast is important because they want to get access to the harbors, they want to get access to illegal trade routes into the waters south. So it's coming south, it's moving south. To prove my point, here is um, a bit of statistics about the attacks against economic interests in Africa. I want you to look at Mozambique. It's indicative of what is happening. In Mozambique, in northern Mozambique, there is uh, um, resources, gas. 
Terrorist groups are invading that space to get access, and it's at the, at the sea, it's in Nampula, it's in northern, northern Mozambique. So they've got access to the sea. They've got access to places that are invaded by, by or potentially invaded by pirates. And, and they want the access to the economic resources in Mozambique. So they're attacking northern Mozambique for tactical reasons. One of the reasons why they are in DRC, I'm coming back to that point I made earlier, is because there is economic resources there. There's mining activities and they need the money. So they're trying to get access to the mining activities in DRC. Same in Burkina Faso. Same, obviously, some of the resources in your country, Nigeria. Now, we've tried everything. We've tried everything in the book to solve it. Despite all this, despite all this, it's expanding. So we need to ask the question. Not just the question, why? I've tried to you know, answer that a little bit. But the next question is, now what? What are we going to do? We've tried securitization. Put more money into the security apparatus. Put more hardware. As if we're in the old war paradigm. As if it isn't a new war. Just pour in more security into the mixture. We've tried that. So far, successes are limited, to put it mildly. Mali, Niger, Cameroon. Limited success when we um, confront this thing as if it was a classical war situation, limited successes. Then we try to control financial flows. Yes, with success initially, but they've got a response and the response mechanism is probably worse. So it worked, yes, but the success is also a failure. And then the soft approach goes under counter-radicalization, CVE, PVE, there's a whole debate, we all know that. Hearts and minds, old-fashioned development cooperation, all that. Has it given us results? I'm not sure. Maybe Kenya, there is a bit of a result in Kenya. So there's a, you know, there is some diamonds and flowers that grow. But generally speaking, the soft approach, the hearts and minds approach hasn't worked so far large scale, small scale, yes. <coughs> 10 people there, 15 young people in Mali, yes. But it doesn't give you a real resilient mechanism for the full population of Nigeria or Burkina Faso. So the hearts and minds soft approach, limited success. And then there's those who say, okay, but it's all about, it's all about religious interpretation. If we give them the right interpretation of religion, then they will get it. I'm not going to be cynical, <laughs> but so far, people didn't buy it. Alternative religious narratives, the securitization of the, of the mosques, yes, some governments try it. You securitize your own religious space. Those actors that are against that will find a solution to that, a way around it. So alternative religious narratives, I haven't seen many successes so far. Now I'm going to end on a very optimistic <laughs> note. This should inspire us to find the real answer. The real answer is in understanding the question that you asked, the why. And if the why is about governance, and the why is about the conflict between a modern imported governance system and a traditional corrupted politicized governance system, then we are witnessing the birth 
campaigns of a new African governance system. So the real answer, if the, if the problem is a governance issue, then the answer is a proper, respected, population, community-based governance system. And it's up to you, those who live and work in Africa, to find that answer. Thank you.